Okay, we'll start in just under a minute. Let people uh, get settled. All right, uh, we will jump right in. Uh, my name is Lars Peterson. I'm very pleased to be here um, to really talk about a topic that affects all of us right now in some way or another, um, navigating change in times of uncertainty. Um, before we get started, I want to just a couple things. We will monitor questions and those will be answered um, at the end. Um, so feel free to uh, put your questions in. And just a, just a bit about um, my background so that you know my perspective. And when I talk about, when I use some client stories, uh, no names, of course, uh, you'll know what I mean by clients. Um, I'm, uh, in 2013, I uh, completed graduate school and became a psychotherapist. I'm now in private practice in West Des Moines. And I also do um, a lot of work for EFR, Employee Family Resources, uh, which includes presentations like this. Um, my other part of my background also includes family business consulting, um, sales, marketing, management, mediation. Um, so I've definitely navigated a lot of change in my own life. Um, some of it uh, that I uh, really made happen and some that happened to me. So uh, with that, we will just go ahead and jump in. And that's assuming I can forward the slides. So give me just a moment. Okay, so today's objectives, pretty simple. This is not gonna be a long presentation. Um, so we wanna make sure we hit some things uh, pretty well. One is just gain a deeper level of awareness of the change process, including why, how and why we often react to change in unhelpful ways. Uh, by understanding that, then we can change our behaviors and change what we do so we can react in more skillful ways. Um, gain a, a better understanding of what it means to be resilient in the face of change. And learn strategies and perspectives for effectively navigating the changes and uncertainty associated with COVID-19. So we want, especially the last part, to be very practical. Um, I'm going to ask you, though, to consider some things as we go. So I'll be leaving a few seconds here and there. For you just to kind of check in with yourself and um, and really see how this impacts you. And one example is that before we go to the next slide, I'd like you to take just a moment to consider what your definition of change is. How do you define change? So for today, it's going to be a very simple definition. Something old stops, something new begins. Um, could be a change, a job change. It could be a relationship change. It could be uh, something associated with now working at home and you were working in the office. You're having your groceries delivered now. You were going to the store without thinking twice about it. Uh, but basically, an old or current way stops, something new begins. So, for the next slide, I'm going to ask you some fill in the blank questions. And I don't want you, I'm not going to give you a lot of time to think about the answers to these questions, but just react and see what comes up uh, very first for you when we start these. So filling in the blanks, I change. The next one, the change associated with COVID-19 has been, and the next one, uncertainty is. Okay, I'm pretty sure your mind filled in the blanks because that's what our minds do. And from doing a presentation like this uh, with uh, participants face-to-face, uh, -face, I also know that many people don't associate positive emotions with change. 
sometimes people fill in the blanks and say things like, I hate change, or change is hard, or uh, uncertainty is hard. I like to control things. I like to know where things are going. So just kind of know how, how um, your kind of default position is about, you know, around change. Context is important, right? Change can be exciting and fun when we choose it. Change that we didn't choose can be much harder. Change that we didn't choose coupled with a lot of uncertainty, like in our present environment, can be even harder. So we, many of us have had to make some changes uh, and then knowing that we're gonna make more changes soon. So there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that. So this is a, a simple model of transition, meaning the internal response to change, what goes on within us when there's a change. And typically, and we could you know, go into more phases, but, but really it breaks down into three phases, an ending, a losing, uh, maybe a losing of a relationship, a job, whatever it could be, a letting go, okay. Um, then we go into a neutral zone where we're not quite sure what to make of things. It can be very creative and also very chaotic. Uh, it can feel very difficult for a lot of people to be in that neutral zone, really not knowing what that next step is gonna be like. Um, the new beginning then is the start of something new. Again, with the current situation, we've got, for many of us, a new beginning. Um, and then we're gonna have another new beginning uh, and maybe another one after that uh, because of all the uncertainty. So a good question to ask yourself, and I'll pause just for a moment so you can check in, is where am I in this process? Am I still back in the feeling like I'm losing something and having a hard time letting go of the way things were, spending a lot, a lot of time thinking about it? Am I in that neutral zone where I feel very uh, unsettled inside? Or am I starting to uh, make progress in this new normal? Um, another good question to ask yourself is, is there any part of my reality that I'm having difficulty letting go of? Okay, am I stuck somewhere? Right. Uh, those can be very useful questions just to understand where we're at in the process. So some stressors that make this change particularly hard are social distancing and isolation. So I'm gonna be using without names, uh, of course, or not any identifying factors, probably changing male to female and a lot of things like that, but I'm gonna be using some of my clients. Um, for one thing, I think people can connect to it and know that they're not alone in struggling with some of these things. So the social distancing isolation, it's, it's been interesting. I've had a couple of clients email me very early on and say, you know, I think I'm good right now. This social distancing, I'm a real introvert and I know how to be alone. This, this isn't really much different. Uh, that's definitely the minority. Um, many people are struggling with that. Um, it, I've had several appointments already today, uh, telehealth appointments, and that's come up, this, how hard that is. And then the uncertainty about it. One, one of the clients I talked to was like, well, should I go to this family get together? It's a birthday thing. Everyone else is going, but I've got some underlying health conditions. Should I, shouldn't I? And, and they don't think it's that big a deal. So uh, there's just some uncertainty that makes that hard. Um, and along with that, then concern about getting sick, self or family. If you're any kind of a first responder, um, if you're working in grocery stores or deliveries or different things, then that, that concern might be really for yourself uh, or if you have an underlying health condition or family members. Um, so a concern there that's real. Uh, financial and work stress. Um, one of my sessions earlier today was about work stress related to this person having two small kids at home who do not get along well. Okay, so he's trying to be a referee, trying to do his work, trying to take calls, do meetings, uh, and it's not easy, really not easy. So, uh, and I've just had a, a call this week from a client who thought he could do okay without the telehealth thing. And then um, text me this uh, this week and said, I need to get in. I need to I need to see you and try this out because um, I'm really concerned about my finances. He's a business owner in this case. So there's financial and work stress, boredom, 
Um, one of my sessions this week was talking with a client about the use of alcohol when she's bored. Okay, so uh, when we're bored, we do many different things. Maybe we binge watch, who, who knows? Um, lack of routine and structure, that whole Groundhog Day thing uh, where the days feel very similar to each other. Um, and then the distraction strategies that are no longer available or reduced. So there's a couple ways to look at that. I mean, that can actually be a positive thing because we can no longer distract ourselves. We may have to face some diff difficult feelings or a difficult decision. Um, and it's just not as easy to distract ourselves. Uh, people can be pretty creative with that. <laughs> so there's still plenty of that going on. Uh, but like a client of mine recently said, you know, I finished watching, binge watching one of the shows I've been watching for a while and then kind of went through some sadness that that's over and then I'm trying to figure something else to watch. So um, that distraction and boredom, those can be, can be stressors. And as part of the, you know, that's just part of the change. So we're going to talk a little bit now, not, not in a lot of depth, but just about how we're wired, how, uh, how we have this built-in threat system that's there to protect ourselves physically and emotionally, but sometimes is, uh, goes too far. And then we get kind of locked into this uh, stress and, and anxiety response. So, just looking at this pretty simply, uh, we have built into us a threat and self-protection system, okay? So, um, if a car, if you were out driving recently and a car swerved into your lane, you would not go into your head and start thinking, geez, I wonder if they're texting, maybe they're eating, I don't know, were they looking at, you know, maybe getting a different song on the radio? You would not do that. You would immediately react. There would be adrenaline and cortisol. Uh, the amygdala in your brain would be, you know, really sending out strong signals. So you would react very, very quickly. It's the strongest and fastest system in our body. And there's some of the emotions that are seen as negative uh, that go along with the threat and protection system. Um, this was really useful when there were saber-toothed tigers roaming. Um, and it can still be useful, for example, when a car swerves in our lane um, or when we're learning about the different ways that we need to protect ourselves in a pandemic. That threat system needs to be there. Um, another system is the drive system. So you can see the blue circle. And drive is about getting what we need. It's achievement. Uh, it used to mean finding food, clothing, shelter, figuring out how to make a fire. Um, all of those things. Uh, now it's about maintaining our job, keeping our job, getting a different job, uh, paying our bills, uh, and also the uh, the fun and, and pleasant and exciting things would be within the drive system. Soothing is soothing and contentment. It's all about being calm and connect, uh, content and connected, okay? And that system, unlike the other two systems, is kind of a rest and digest, just a, a calming where we can kind of take stock of things and uh, it's just a, uh, and I think when we show, when I show you a picture that's associated with the soothing and contentment system, that you'll get it immediately what that's like. So the important thing is that these three systems are in balance depending on our circumstances. So I'm gonna ask you again, just to take a moment to reflect which of those systems, if you had to draw each system on a piece of paper, which system would be the largest? Where do you spend the most time? Would it be some sense of being a little anxious, on edge, worried, angry? Would it be really focused? Um, or would it be just content, feeling safe, uh, feeling good? So just take a second to notice. So this threat system, again, is all about fight, flight, or freeze. Um, used to be all about physical danger. Okay, again, the saber-toothed tiger. And, you know, if uh, Thor and Jane were living in a cave and Thor heard a sound outside, and Thor is just kind of a curious, happy-go-lucky guy, and he ventures outside quickly. Well, if he did that enough times, there'd be a saber-toothed tiger out there at some point, and 
Thor would be no longer, okay? And he wouldn't have kids. Uh, that lineage would stop there. So really over time, we've it's, it's built into us to be a little bit cautious, okay? If we mistake a rope for a snake, we think that the rope is a snake and it's not. That's not a big deal. If we mistake a poisonous snake for a rope, we think it's a rope and it's not, that's a big deal. So that's the threat system that's built into us. What's, um, so as, as helpful as that is, we humans have this very uh, skilled thinking brain. So we not only uh, see a poisonous snake and react, we can think about a poisonous snake, or we can think about a time we said something in a meeting, or we, get, we can think about getting sick and what that'd be like. What if I get COVID? What if my daughter gets COVID? What if my dad gets, whatever, wh whatever that is. We can have a what if thought and go right into that threat system. So that's what, dif that's what differentiates us uh, from all of the other animals is we can do great things with our brain, but we also, it can also uh, make us worried, stressed, and anxious. So drive system. This is about getting things done, uh, acquiring the resources we need. Since we're not eight feet tall, we don't have claws, we can't fly, uh, we have this system built into us to go out and find ways to get what we need. So an activated drive system in these times might be cleaning out the basement, decluttering, working on projects that you've put off. Um, I'm pretty sure that houses are cleaner right now than they have been in many, many months, if not years, and that there's been some projects. I know in our house, there's been some projects that have risen to the level of, let's actually do those, uh, that were not there. So that's the drive system. Sometimes we can go into drive system, do cleaning or, or sorting or whatever that is, go into the drive system because we feel a sense of threat and we're just trying to escape the threat. Um, but that's the drive system. Okay, soothing content. I think you, from this picture, I think you get a, a pretty quick picture of what that's like. Um, for all you animal lovers out there, I can't hear you right now, but I'm guessing there was some ah or you know some some sounds even that you made. Uh, it's a very very cute picture, but that's that sense of being safe, being content, being soothed. Um, so. There's a couple different ways we can activate the soothing content system. One is by other beings, and I say beings because it can be animals. A lot of my clients find a lot, and, and myself as well, find a lot of comfort um, soothing with animals. Um, so it can be animals, it can be other people who really understand us and are very supportive. Uh, and it also, as we'll talk about later, we can find ways to soothe ourselves when we're squarely in that threat system when our mind is doing all the what ifs or why did I's, uh, you know, either the what ifs about the future or the ruminating about the past, um, there's ways to short circuit that and get into that soothing and content system that we'll discuss. So experiencing change. What we want again, are these systems to be in balance. And when they are, we're open to new ways to do things. We're curious about options, even though things are hard. We reach out to others. We have kind of a yes and. And I, uh, um, excellent example, it seems like whenever I'm going to do a presentation, um, I have three or four or five clients that week, earlier in the week or the week before that just almost uh, fit perfectly what I'm gonna say. And that was one, uh, let's see, about three hours ago, I was talking to a person and I'm not gonna use a real name, we'll say uh, Liam. And um, in the hospitality industry, and this person uh, is has some immune system issues, some underlying health issues, um, so really needs to take care and do what they can to not get sick. Um, on Over the weekend though, that they went into uh, their the place where they work, and they interacted with a number of people relatively close at times, much more than they wanted to. They thought about that on Monday, about what the weekend was like and the risk that they may have put themselves in. 
and spent the rest of the day Monday uh, either in bed or just feeling very anxious and doing whatever they could to distract themselves. So what happens when that threat system gets engaged, when we get really anxious about something and we start all the what if things or why did I's, um, our world gets very narrow. So this person, Liam, again, not the real name, um, could not think about options. It was just all about why did I do that and what's gonna happen now and just got very stuck. So um, I was able to help Liam access the, the soothing content system, find some ways to, to calm down enough. And then uh, Liam knew a number of things she could do, he could do to uh, develop a plan. So um, experiencing change when we're balanced, um, much easier to do, much more effective. Self-care in the three systems. So just briefly, a question to ask yourself, what are some things I'm doing to distract myself or attempt to cope that are not helpful? Um, what are activities or practices that soothe or calm me? Maybe petting my dog or taking my dog for a walk or my cat, or maybe it's listening to music, maybe it's mindfulness or prayer or meditation. Um, and then what are activities or practices that energize and or fulfill me, the drive system? So when people are really feeling anxious, sometimes it's better to, if they're a runner, to go for a run. If they're a walker, go for a, a walk. Uh, get that drive system activated. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about self-care. And I realize that we're going over these relatively quickly, but um, there's definitely resources that you can find on, on all of this. And I'll talk a little bit about the resources at EFR at the end, but there's, um, there's our uh, psychotherapists at EFR who do telehealth counseling. So there's lots of ways to take this further, if you'd like. Remembering my strengths. This is something that people don't think about much. Um, I just heard a talk, a TED talk by Elizabeth Gilbert, where she actually brought this up as well. I don't know how many of you know Elizabeth Gilbert. She's an author. But it can be really good. A lot of our when we're in that threat system and feeling anxious, a lot of that is about can I handle ABC? Can I handle it? So taking a little bit of time to really reflect on what have I gone through in the past that's been hard? What's been challenging? And how did I get through it? What strengths did I utilize? What resources did I call upon? Um, and how did I find meaning and purpose in what I was doing? So. We'll talk a little bit more about the importance of meaning and purpose, but it's, it's highly important in helping us get through a time like this, a change and the uncertainty uh, with COVID. So Nelson Mandela, in prison for 27 years and then became later president of South Africa, um, talks about being busy from 7 a.m. until midnight before prison, never having time to think. Uh, but when he was in a single cell in prison, he was able to, you know, really view his life with clarity and really see, really gain a lot of knowledge and wisdom about himself and about what he wanted in life. So just a little bit about, you know, we, we for some of us, social isolation is very difficult. And I don't want to in any way undermine how difficult that is, especially if we are very extroverted or we have some mental health issues that we're struggling with or some family issues. Um, or if you like one of my I'm seeing a couple who was thinking about divorce right before COVID, and now they're kind of together <laughs> uh, more time than maybe they were uh, thinking they that would be healthy for them. So, so I'm not meaning to say to minimize any of that, um, but just to give some perspective, um, he was allowed one visitor a year for 30 minutes. He could write and receive one letter every six months. Uh, and yet, even with all of that, he was able to find a way, and again, not easy, and I'm not saying it's easy for anyone, uh, but it is possible with enough work and, and uh, searching to, to find meaning and purpose in that. So a question to ask yourself along those lines is two years, it's a year, it's five years, it's 10 years, but I'm looking back on this time. What do I want to be able to say about how I handled it? A very different question than what's going to happen, why did this happen, uh, you know, what if this happens and that happens and how will I handle that? This is very different. This is more about, okay, a lot I don't know right now, a lot coming at me right now, 
looking back, how do I want to be able to say, what do I want to be able to say about myself, about how I handled it? Okay. So it can be a very powerful question. I use that question a lot uh, with my clients. So some opportunities within my situation. Maybe some of these apply to you. Maybe they don't. Maybe you've already done all of these. Uh, but some people these days are doing a digital reset. It's a good time to redo passwords. Uh, for me, it's been a good time to uh, unsubscribe from a number of newsletters that I never read, but they keep coming in my inbox and I just delete them. Uh, maybe it's a time to strengthen relationships with family members, not only maintain or, um, you know, be able to get along with, but actually strengthen relationships. Um, maybe I know, uh, and my, my family has done that as well, Zoom meetings with people that live a long ways away that we don't see that often, all of a sudden, or some kind of an online meeting. Start and continue exercise. There's all kinds of uh, apps and exercises out there right now that are designed specifically for uh, social distancing. Maybe it's undertaking a learning project, online library. Coursera is a, um, has a lot of courses, many of them for free. So it's Coursera, just do a, a Google search on that. Um, Self-reflection, eating healthier. So the question again is, are there any opportunities within my situation? So Ziggy usually has uh, something pretty interesting to say, and, and this time he does as well. And that's basically everything is subject to change without notice. So um, a few people have talked about pandemics for, for quite a while, but in general, uh, many of us, the vast majority of us did not expect to be where we are right now, okay? Um, and we don't know how it's gonna change in the future. So being able to be resilient in that face of change, to find meaning, uh, to find ways to um, lower our stress, get out of that threat system, um, is really helpful. So this is by Doreen Marshall, who's a whitewater rafter. And basically just saying, when you're thrown out of a raft, your first instinct is to stand up, resist. You know, we talked about the ed ends, the end part of change of a transition and climb back into the raft. She says simply, don't. It's moving and slippery. You won't go back in, e in easily, no matter how hard you try. Better to wrap your arms around your life vest, pull your feet up in front of you, and let the rapids carry you down the river until you're in calmer waters. There you can assess things. Very much like the client I mentioned, once that client was able to come down and, and, and get out of that uh, threat system, out of all that anxiety and angst that they were in, they were able to see much more clearly. So oftentimes that's the first thing we need to do, not figure things out, but actually get a sense of calm and focus and purpose. A um, little bit about the EAP benefits. 24-hour uh, phone support is an important part of this. Um, this says in-person counseling sessions, uh, that has been available, but also telehealth is available. And about three and a half weeks ago, I went 100% to telehealth. About 95% of my clients are, uh, we're meeting that way. And um, it's working uh, extremely well. So if you have reservations about it, but really think you, you could benefit, then I would urge you to try it, to, to um, call EFAR and, and, and just try it out yourself. And with that, I think we're very close to our, our 30 minutes. With that, we will take uh, any questions. Yes, so if you have a question for Lars, go ahead and use the raise hand function and that question will pop up for me and then I will just kind of moderate and we will put Lars on the spot and ask him some good questions about our topic today. <laughs> Lars, we did have one come in and it's uh, related to just, is it common to jump between emotions um, during situations such as this? And uh, is it common for it to even be kind of moment to moment or one minute you're feeling a certain way and the next minute you're feeling very different? It's a, it's a great question. Um, Yes, that would be, if you remember that uh, transition slide, the ending, the, the middle, and the uh, new beginning. 
in that when it still feels kind of chaotic and there's a lot of uncertainty, it's very common to cycle quickly between emotions. Um, so that's a very normal thing. I've experienced it in my own life and I definitely hear that from my clients. Um, what's most helpful then is just to let those emotions cycle through, not try to push those away um, and just let them cycle through because they will. If they're too strong, obviously you can do some things to um, reduce the emotions, but in general, just letting them cycle through is a normal part of the process. Thanks, Lars. Okay, this next question is something I can certainly relate to. It's coming from someone saying, do you have any advice for balancing work and home life for someone still working full time and having a young child at home? I'm working around the clock and have no separation between work and home. Huh. Wow. Uh, I wish I had really good advice for that one. That's a that's a challenge. That's a, a that's a big one. Um, I guess one of the one of the pieces of that can be any way that you can create separation either uh within the house like this is where i work this is where i don't this is when i work this is when i don't you know time blocking th these two hours i'm working these hours i'm not i'm not taking calls i'll check email i'll do those things even even simple things like i've had a client who um and this was before covid who would change clothes. He was in the IT industry, so he already already dressed casually. So he'd get out of one pair of Dockers and put on another pair of Dockers. But that let his brain know, okay, I'm home. This is different now. So this sounds like an answer that is a little glib to me because I don't know your full situation. I think it's a real challenge for people. And I think it's, um, you know, uh, getting any kind of support you can from others, and then as best you can, creating boundaries and, and uh, blocks between different things. We have a question asking, how would you encourage an employee to utilize professional help if they are uncomfortable or unwilling to do so through these times? I would encourage that, that person to, um, reach out and ask if it's EFR, for example, just ask to do a consultation or ask just to um, gain more information. So uh, instead of taking a giant step, take a baby step uh, and maybe just have a few questions you want, uh, you want answered, maybe get to know the process a little bit since it is most likely gonna be telehealth, maybe get to know what that's like um, and, and just you know, take, a, take a baby step. I, along those lines, I had a, a, a client who, um, this was back when we were going to telehealth, or I was going to telehealth uh, 100%, and she said, nope, it scares me to death. I don't want to do it. I hate technology. I'm too scared. It makes me too anxious. And so we talked about maybe phone. Nope, that makes me too anxious. I can't do it. And so she had some issues come up that she really wanted to talk about. And so I just encouraged her to do a five-minute session. We'll just try out the technology, see what you think of it. We won't even do therapy. Uh, well, we, you know, 60 minutes later, she was saying, well, thanks, I guess we did therapy. Um, so yeah, just take a baby step and see if it's helpful. Excellent, thank you. This is a question uh, related to resources for helping manage responsibilities for two work from home parents with small children under five. Uh, this. Uh, attendee says balancing the responsibility between both parents and helping the child cope with access but not real access to parents while we work so how do you how do you uh, you know parents and work at the same time especially when you have children of a very needy age again really really hard um, that's that was uh, three quarters or really most most of my session with a person today about that very topic um, in this case, the two little ones did not get along while well. there's a ton of conflict between the two. So there's just lots of chaos. Um, it's really dependent on, the, on, on what's going on, the situation, you know, what kind of jobs each person has. Uh, hopefully there's good communication. It sounds like there's uh, two parents in this case, if I understood that right. So hopefully there's very good communication between the two and they can each uh, a work to try and uh, compromise and and do what they can to make it work for each other. Um, I come back to the any any way you can separate either 
physically within the house or time-wise within the house and make some kind of separation so you're not trying to do all of it all at once. Uh, but this, I mean, this is a, there are so many people struggling with this right now. There's a lot of people still trying to figure it out. Yes, I am one of them, so thank you. Uh, what are your recommendations for helping us to identify the needs of our family members of all ages in understanding their emotional needs and how to figure out positive support for them? How to identify the needs of family members, understanding their emotional needs, and how to find positive support? You bet, you bet. Um, important question. So that, I think that's really about, um, being a listener if if I, again i don't know the person asking the question but um, sometimes the people i work with are a little bit more of a teller or an advice giver or or pretty quick to give advice or to tell their kids what they need to be doing or how they need to be viewing something i think um, to address your question is really go into a curiosity mode really really talking to your kids and, and asking them good questions, open-ended questions, not questions that put them on the spot, anything you can do to encourage them to talk. Um, if it's teenagers, maybe it's, if you're okay with going for a drive, you know, just, just maybe you two, uh, you know, going for a drive where they don't have to look you in the face. You know, a lot of uh, those of you with teenagers know that um, it's much easier some, for certain ages of kids to talk if they're not looking directly at you, if you're driving, if you're walking, if you're doing something. Um, so really, really going into that listening curious mode is, is the way to find out more there and, and as much as you can disengaging from thinking that you know what your kids need quickly. All right, this is a, another really good question and it's kind of on the flip side from some of the ones that we've been getting. This is a person saying, you know, when you're living alone, what would you suggest to lower anxiety from being cooped up and being alone for so long? Well, wow, that's a, that's a that's a tough one. I uh, again, a session today uh, this week just addressed that. And in this case, with this client, they had a, a falling out with their really only friend, um, and so um, it's really, you know, some of the things we talked about are are just are there some people that she hasn't connected with for a while that she could reach out to on social media. Could she use technology more effectively? Um, are there are there any ways uh, that you and this can be hard for people, especially if there's some anxiety involved? But are there any ways that you can be the one who reaches out? And along those lines, do you know anyone who could use support? Um, we talked about the importance of meaning and purpose. Being able to reach out to others and give them support. Um, can be really, really helpful in this process. So there's no easy answers there, um, but just really brainstorming uh, relationships, past and present relationships to see if there's anyone you could connect with to get support and also to give support. Thanks, Lars. Uh, this person is asking for recommendations for parents who have seniors, as in seniors in high school at this time. And before you answer, I just want to remind um, that the EAP benefit is a tremendous resource. Uh, we see, regardless of circumstances, we see a spike in uh, utilization with, within, you know, a lot of people going through those life transitions. So their children are going from high school to college or college into the real world. So before Lars gives his answer, I do want to recommend reaching out to the EAP, uh, especially if there's a lot of uncertainty around that transition. Yeah, so that's a huge part of the answer. Can you, uh, I was listening to what you said and I lost a little bit of track of the exact question, if you could repeat that. It's about supporting the senior or? Um, recommendations for parents that have seniors at home. Um, there wasn't. So it wasn't a, a specific question really as far as a, a situation. Um, hmm. I would just recommend I, that if there is an issue yeah. with transition, um, they would reach out to the EAP. Yeah, I think that's oh, great advice. Okay, emotional support without minimizing their feelings. Um, what kind of emotional support could you give, you know, an 18 year old without minimizing their feelings? I'm guessing they probably feel like they've lost out on a lot of opportunities to have their senior year and things go 
um, the way that you know their intent they're supposed to go. Right, right. Um, I would I guess go back to the answer about you know being curious, being uh, asking questions versus telling versus advice giving. Um, I think in this case, maybe all of this senior needs, maybe, I don't know if there's more, and, and that's where the AP would be great if there is more, but maybe uh, just needs someone to really listen and, and, um, and hear them about what it's like for them, so. Um, there was a comment, um, this person says, your suggestion to revisit strengths made me realize I have actually been revisiting my weaknesses, reliving past professional failures out of my fears for my future job security. Do you have any advice for someone who is internalizing negativity in this situation of uncertainty? Um, okay, so EAP is, 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 is kind of a, an answer to many of these, but um, so that is a tough one. Um, I'm guessing it's a somewhat entrenched habit if I'm reading between the lines a little bit. And it can really be useful to um, make a list of all the challenges that one has overcome and and then and leaving room so that for each challenge that has been overcome or has been navigated successfully, um, how how you were able to do that. What personal strengths did you call upon? What resources did you call upon? and actually take some time um there's a lot of good research about guided imagery and imagination and how uh, how helpful that is and how it can rewire the brain so really taking some time to get back, get really in touch with what that was like for you what did that feel like to be able to overcome or to work through those things and be successful um and so i'd say just intentionally since your brain is already kind of on default with some of the negative things and intentionally um, spending some time with that other side. This person is asking if you have any suggestions for those who wish to console or help a person who is struggling with receiving physical support when you're not able to be present for them in person. So struggling to receive physical support? Is that part of it? It says, do you have any suggestions for those who wish to console or help a person who is struggling with receiving physical support, it's a single mother working from home, I'm assuming as a person that needs some help, um, but you're not able to be present for them in person. Wow. Um, that's that's a hard one. Um, I mean, again, um, I think being supportive, being a really good listener, being that soothing kind of content system, if you will, in that person's life can go a long ways and is very much undervalued. Um, if that person's really struggling, suggesting that they um, seek help would be would be helpful. If you can do that in a way that's not uh, seen as advice giving, but seen as coming from a, a caring place. Any particular advice for someone who is pregnant, working from home with a toddler and managing this time of uncertainty? Um, I ditto number three and number seven or whatever those questions were. I, yeah, it's it's no no surprise that's coming up a lot because that is a real challenge. Um, and I don't think I have anything to add other than I what I what I said before. And we have time for one more. We were getting a lot. We have a lot of questions, but there's time for one more. Um, how do you motivate yourself to do the spring cleaning and weekend projects at the house when you are the one who physically goes to the office and feels mentally drained by the time you get home? So someone who's, it sounds like they're still going into work, they're not working from home. Um, that's a tough one. I don't know if there, if there needs to be a crucial conversation with someone else in the household about, you know, uh, helping or sharing responsibilities, uh, reading between the lines that, that might be there. Um, so I guess, uh, motivation is maybe, um, oversold a lot of times, a lot of times it's more about actually taking action. So maybe breaking that task down into some steps and just taking the very first small step. Maybe it's a 10 minute thing, but just, just to get going. Um, there's a, a quote I really like, we don't rise to the level of our wishes or our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. So system in this place might be, you know, 
at this time I'm going to do this and I'm just going to do this little bit. And then, uh, you know, the next day at this time, I'm going to do this little bit. So just really getting just getting going. And one more question, because this, this is a good one. Uh, do you have any advice on how to cope with the issue of technology glitches? Uh, and we know you're not an IT professional, Lars, but um, people getting frustrated by technology glitches, especially as we've moved to a work from home environment, and there's a lot of new, new things that we're learning. Any um, advice for in that moment when you have a technology issue that's really causing frustration, maybe um, a technique that you could share with them to get them to kind of get through that moment? Like, do you have any breathing recommendations or anything that they could do in the moment. Yep, you bet. So um, if you ex extend your exhalation to be twice as long as your inhalation, that tells your body that, hey, there's no threat, there's no need for fight, flight, or freeze. So maybe breathing in for three or four, holding it for a moment, and then breathing out slowly, seven, eight, nine. So about twice as long breathing out, doing three or four, five of those breaths um, can be very calming. Um, Another very simple one, which will sound a little bit goofy, but is just um, looking around and find, finding five different things in the room to focus on, uh, trying to identify a couple sounds, and then noticing five things in your body. So five to five. What that does is it gets, it slows the mind down and gets you out of your mind and into into your senses, into the present moment. And and um, I've known clients who who have been in the middle of a panic attack and have been able to come out of the panic attack with with that last one. So breathing or anything that can get you into your senses. Well, thank you so much, Lars. Those were great questions. Thank you to everyone who uh, submitted a question for Lars. We are at the end of our time this afternoon. We are doing weekly webinars, and so please check back on our website, EFR.org, to get signed up for those. Uh, Lars, I'll let you wrap it up. All right, well, I, uh, thank you everyone. Those were great questions. Um, no surprise that the, the whole, fa how do I navigate uh, family and work at the same time at home? No, no surprise that came up several times. So um, thanks for the great questions and uh, we'll be doing more of these. So maybe I'll see you again.